Hello, everyone. This is Catherine. Thank you for joining me for the second mastermind event in our series from our success team. And while well, Jason here is going to be my co-host for the day, thank you all for joining. I see some people are still joining, working on the to getting the live stream started currently. We're having some technical issues, but the recording is on. So in case the live stream uh, doesn't work, we will definitely share the recording after the event. And well, guys, let me present the, the rock star of the day. So Mutual Webolt, everyone, is here today for the knowledge share. Will started investing in 2011. And as he says, he went with low risk deals first knows more than three or two about making revenue, balancing between the types of deals you do and, and finding hidden gems in the market. Well, goes by your word means everything. And he markets in Phoenix, Arizona. Also, please post your questions in the chat and feel free to participate in the conversation. That's definitely what, what we're looking for. So thank you all for being here. And uh, well, what do you say we kick it off with, uh, with the first question? Sure. Sounds good. Right. Also, well, just before I ask the first question, anything that I might have missed in your intro, anything you would like to add? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I would say um, if you guys have any questions or anything, obviously post them now, but, it, you know, sometimes you think of them later. So um, I'll have Catherine put my contact information, my cell phone number and my email and feel free to reach out to me anytime. I love to you know collaborate with people and I'm happy to help any way I can. Absolutely, guys. Just sharing, sharing Will's contact info here in the chat box so you have it. Well, thank you so much once again for your intro and thank you for being here. So I'll I'll let Jason in and Will here give you the REI perspective of things and the SMS marketing perspective, which is going to be Jason's expertise, obviously, uh, Will's expertise, I think, that you all are going to learn much more about today. So, Will, let's let's kick it off from this one. How how to talk about deals in a competitive market and how to close it, which is our topic of the day. Um, how to refocus your target, for example, from wholesaling to, to fix and flip, talking about the experience that you've had in, in deals, deal closing and diff different types of deals. Um, what would you say to that primarily? Yeah, sure. So I'm in the Phoenix market and there's, I mean, this is the market where everybody starts. It's like where Open Door, OfferPad, all of them, where hedge funds come in first. Like it just, it's like a melting pot of all the new, um, new ideas and new investors and everything. So it's a little bit intimidating uh, getting started because you're kind of like, how am I going to compete with these guys? So what I what I did um, that worked for me was to keep it super, super simple in the beginning. Um, so I started by working backwards. I'm like, I'm going to find, you know, the buyers connect with them first, you know, in the same exact type of areas. And then I actually um, focused strongly on a niche. So I would actually go down to as far as subdivision level and um, I would personalize the messages to, uh, you know, include the subdivision name. Uh, I found I got better response rates like that. But I mean, instead of working on the entire Valley, which is, you know, everything from 1900s to, you know, brand new build and, you know, everywhere from a hundred thousand dollar mobile home to a $27 million mountain estate, I I focused on specifically the um, kind of the median price range and properties that were 2000 to 2015. And that was exactly what the hedge funds were buying. So, um, and that was also what I, I had bought in the in the past as well. So I kind of knew that that market. But um, so first, I guess you know finding the niche and as in general, I say like if everybody else is doing it, just do the opposite. You know, so like um, the competition in Phoenix anyway, was, you know, they were, they were buying stuff or marketing this stuff with, you know, $150,000 spread, you know, a 1960 built that needed $120,000 of renovation, um, you know, those type of markets. But the problem is those sellers are getting, you know, a hundred text messages. And when you go show up at their house, they've got a stack of mail in their mailbox, all from a bunch of companies like us. So um, I was like, well, where, where are, where can I go where there's, I'm not going to be competing with that. And it tended to be the uh, track home build. So 
Um, it worked really well over the past few years because, you know, prices were appreciating and we had just a ton of money sloshing around with hedge funds and with obviously high buyers. Uh, but I've had to kind of shift um, over the last year as things changed. Um, but anyway, either way, like finding the niche is definitely the way to uh, compete in a, in a market like this and then working backwards. And as far as like the type of deals, um, so when you're starting out, or at least for me, I didn't have a whole lot of cash. So um, my main concern was, you know, making cash quickly, basically. So I started primarily focused on wholesales and I was wholesaling to flippers, but I've always believed I'm never going to get a contract signed unless I'm willing to close it myself. So I underwrote it that way. Like if I have to flip this, can I do it? Do I have the funding lined up and everything? Um, but I did probably, I don't know, 45, 50 wholesales first before I even dipped my toe into the flipping um, game. And then I just kind of slowly moved, you know, it, it was like 100% wholesale. Then it was like 80% wholesale, 20% flips. And, you know, as I got my crew um, built up that I trusted, which is a whole nother story, um, you know, I ended up being about 50-50. Uh, so that's that's what I would recommend is like, you know, having a having the niche is the biggest thing, but then um, having like a strategy where it's like, all right, when I hit, like for me, it was when I hit 150000 in uh, my bank account, then I'm comfortable to flip. And I mean, there's various different measures you could use, obviously, but that was my measure. Um, and just stick to that, you know, don't get, <laughs> don't get too, uh, tempted by potentially like what I was seeing is I was wholesaling a deal for six grand and the guy would turn around and sell it in less than 60 days and make 45, 60, whatever. And that was happening over and over and over again. I'm like, I just gotta be, you know, I gotta stick to my strategy. I'm glad I did because, um, I could have gotten in some pretty, uh, deep water there pretty fast, but that's what worked for me. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, this honestly, uh, this honestly very uh, well correlates with the uh, fact with the market shifting as well. Um, for example, right now, since well, the, the price has reached an all time in the U.S., which is great for fix and flippers, but not a very good time for wholesalers. So it's always great to have that uh, flexibility where you're wholesaling, and then if changes occur within the market, within the prices, you can always switch to a different way of marketing until the market is back up so you can return to wholesaling. But if we we were to talk it uh, talk about it on the system level and and texting um uh, we'll mention a very important thing and that's content, right? So niche, uh, niche definitely 100% um just like will said um he's kind of going backwards. So finding your niche is a very very important thing, but also content and segmentation. Right. So if you have like kind of a, a niche, there are definitely some subdivisions, just like Will said, um, that you can further, er, further segment through so you can keep all of those KPIs separate. Now, on the launch control side, um, there is a way, I mean, it isn't really a way, but you can definitely keep everything under one one roof in one account kind of switch from wholesaling to fix and flipping or fix and holding or maybe even <laughs> FDR. Um, but then again, in my opinion, I would rather advise to keep it separated. So use one account for wholesaling, another account for fix and flipping. So you can kind of keep everything separated and see exactly what brings more results, whether you should change your approach, uh, focus on, on, on the uh, wholesaling primarily for the time being, switch to a different but then again, content, as I mentioned, is very, very important because if you're uh, targeting a specific city, specific county, you want to make sure to further personalize your messages to hit that specific county. Um, I've seen that happen very, very rarely. It's just the people text blasting using the general off-market approach and just sending those messages. But if you want to really dig deeper and really find out what your niche is and where you want to take your business, you definitely want to go deeper into the segmentation, finding your niche further, uh, personalizing your messages, and kind of trying to keep everything separate for better tracking of the KPIs. Absolutely. And basically, just um, identifying who you're talking to. It's always very important, especially for this kind of personalized approach. And, and Jason mentioned this expression that we absolutely banned from launch control, which is Text blast, yeah, <laughs> yeah. JC, by the way, 
you will have access to to the recording and we're right now working on fixing the live stream but if not the video is going to be uploaded as soon as branded in our on our facebook group so no worries on youtube as well same as as the previous one so basically guys going back to knowing who you're talking to your content is going to depend on that heavily and not just your initial messages. Your initial messaging should be the opening. We were just, Jason and I, discussing that with Will during uh, the prep for this one. It's very important to have your messages uh, go in a sequence. Your initial message goes just as the conversation opener, right? But then your follow-ups, your manual replies sent through your inbox, your quick replies, all the messaging should play into what you opened with and and will very much in detail explain to to me and Jason that he went as far as targeting the specific neighborhood and and just addressing all those prospects in that neighborhood the way that he recognized that they talk so it's it's basically the mirror image of of communication that's something that people respond to pretty well it it goes back to to basic human psychology and, yeah, and small campaigns is okay like you know that's and sending out 50 at a time instead of 150 at a time is fine like you know more more message templates not less like you know change it up and see what works and then just do small batches um because once you find it like you, you'll notice it'll pop like um it made a it made a big difference or we were even talking about in the vein of do what other people aren't doing you know last or in 2021 towards the end of the year i was sending you know happy thanksgiving out and merry christmas and whatever and the response rates i got when i did that were you know almost double like just a normal template so and i find that to be the same the two the two deals that i've made the most money on that have been the most profitable for me have come from marketing to uh people in a specific county that have between 10 and 50 rental properties that are titled in their own name and I, like the template that i made was just talking directly to those people you know you're not going to talk the same to somebody who lives in a house as you will to somebody who owns a, you know owns it as a rental or a second home um you're not going to talk to the the people that have 10 properties the same as you talk to somebody with one rental either so uh, just individually uh, individualizing is what I had a lot of, a lot of uh, success with. Absolutely. Um, well, just going uh, going to the next question, but uh, as Will and Jason both mentioned, we had a small trend, which is kind of an annual trend, sometime around the the end of last year, start of this one, and that is something that we very often hear. Someone has used the account for, let's say, a month or two. They got their pipeline established. They've had conversations with the prospects. Their CRM is active. And then there was that holiday break. So some of the investors came to think, okay, this is a holiday break. Everyone, so basically anyone, not anyone will be open to, to talk a deal at this time of the year, right? So let me take a break now. But on the other hand, reverse psychology why are you taking a break now that your competition is leaving the holiday season especially if you're a beginner investor and i'm pretty sure we got a mixed crowd in this call that is something that that you want to utilize to your advantage so well thank you for your answer and uh well as far as the next question goes if the budget is limited how to how to create financing solutions that's something that we would like to touch on yeah um so I guess in general, I've always, and this is kind of a long way around to get there, but like, I'm, I'm like a constant, constantly learning new things. So if there's, you know, different strategies out there, like I always want, I'm listening to a podcast, I'm listening to an audio book, I'm reading, I'm doing whatever I need to do to learn, you know, cause, cause if you don't want to be a one trick pony, cause everybody's, everybody's situation is unique. So it's, um, you know, as you learn more and more and you're comfortable with these different strategies, like you can just convert so many more deals, you know, um, like if a deal doesn't, you know, just be, I guess by, by being a one trick pony, what I mean is like, don't just have the cash offer in your back pocket, you know, um, there's so many other ways to, to, um, create deals. So, you know, I guess the way that I've been, so I had an overall strategy of, it's going to be wholesaling to make the, the money, then flipping. And those are both basically active income to build up the cash, 
And then after that, I'm putting that into rentals and using tax strategies to, you know, pay less tax and all of that. And that's still my strategy long term. But like I was buying rentals on seller carrybacks. I was buying rentals using, you know, um, using a fix and flip loan and then refinancing it into a rental loan. I was That's what I was doing for the last few years. But right now, what I've found is in the market, um, people are very open to um, creative financing, like allowing you to take over their loan, buying it subject to uh, different. So I'm, so I'm digging into that right now. And like, just as a, an example, last year, I bought one property um, for 400 and some thousand. And I ended up putting 45 grand down on that property, got a seller carry back that was like four and a half percent interest. Great deal, right? So far in the last month, I've gotten three properties under contract with a total of $5,000 out of pocket, like down payment total. And those are going to cash flow. Each one of those will cash flow better than that deal I did last year. So, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm noticing a lot in the market, like over the past few years, you've been able to, you know, honestly tell people a cash offer is really your best bet because it gives you certainty. You're not going to be taking much of a haircut to selling it on the MLS. Like, you know, the cash offers were com competitive and even potentially above um, all the other strategies. Well, that's not the case right now. So, I mean, each each market is individual, but our days on market went from about 12 to 90 in the span of, you know, four, three, four months. Um, so now it's a conversation of, well, do you have the time? What's your next step? Are you buying a new house? Like, you know, and and getting individual with the people, like what are they trying to accomplish? Because as an example, a guy that I'm uh, working with right now, um, if he was to sell his house on MLS, it'd be worth 350, something like that. A year ago, it was worth 450. So that's one of the market, that's one of the specific areas of our market that got crushed the most because it was open door and offer pad and hedge funds all very heavily allocated over there. Those properties dropped very quickly. Um, and the days on market spiked. So, you know, probably best case scenario, he would get an offer for 350. Right now, concessions are way up. So um, take 10% off that for his net, basically, that's 315, something like that. He would basically, after paying off the mortgage, walk away with about 30, 35 grand. So that's fine. But what if I give him 375 net? I take over his mortgage for, you know, three years, five years, whatever maybe give him 10 grand down and work with lenders so he can buy a new house. Now he just gained, you know, $70,000 in equity. He just has to wait a little bit for it. So those are the conversations I've been having a lot lately and people are very interested in it because it's such a major day. I mean, for most of these people, it's double the cash and you know, it's a, it's a big deal. So um, I'm not sure if I answered that question, but that's, yeah, as far as creative financing, that's what I'm thinking about right now. Well. And it's also definitely to, uh, to go back to uh, defining your niche. So before we actually find the niche, we have to explore different opportunities, right? But even when you find the niche, it might happen that that niche, you might like it, but it's not really suiting you the way that you want to market your leads. So it all comes down to um, finding something, exploring further, deeper, exploring again and again and again. And if you see that something might not be working for you, it's that the way is definitely not to pull away from real estate. And I'm like, okay, so real estate is not working for me. I'm going to go try maybe concretely in real estate wholesaling and so on maybe i'm going to try airbnb or something like that but then again there are a lot of opportunities for example if high equity is not working for you maybe you should switch to targeting um probate tax lien pre-foreclosure and so on and so on um it really it really comes down to you walking into a specific market with a specific buy box right so there are a lot of competitors out there that have a larger buy box than you and kind of are toggling between properties that are worth a lot more. But then again, there are a lot of a small, a smaller investors that are competing for the same property. And all of those investors are pretty much similar with their buy box. So um, creative financing, 100% agree with you, Will, on that. Definitely a way to go um, if you're kind of stuck in, in, in a certain place, if you want to find your way out and see different opportunities. Um, but then again, it all comes down to 
how should I say, kind of like the babushka doll, right? So you take a big picture and then you find smaller pictures within that picture and then smaller pictures within those pictures and just kind of keep exploring until you set yourself to that point. Okay, so I'm here in a real estate. I'm I'm do, I'm investing. I'm wholesaling, fix and flipping, whatever might be your niche. Um, I'm going to focus 100%. I'm going to try to segment as much as possible. I'm going to try to personalize my content, which we already talked about. So there are definitely a lot of things that there is a lot of fine tuning. It's not just, okay, so I got the big picture. There are a lot of fine tuning. So it's like a piece of the puzzle. You need all the pieces in order to get the picture first, but it's all about finding those pieces. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. I would I'd say one more thing. So you mentioned three foreclosures and tax liens and all that. So from 2019 through the entire 2021 year, like I stayed away from those lists entirely because that's like, you know, if you see the gurus and whatever on, on YouTube and, you know, everything blasting out, you know, pre foreclosures, plea foreclosure, pre foreclosure, like that's all I hear from people that want to, you know, hey, I want to start investing, like pre I'm going to do this. That sounds like such a good idea. Well, everybody else was doing that, right? So I didn't even think about marketing to those lists, but uh, over the past probably nine months, I've started to market to those, but I'm hitting them in a different way. I'm talking to them about, you know, I know you're getting bombarded with, you know, $250,000 offers when your house is worth three fifty, dollars you know, and they're getting that over and over again. But I'm, I don't know, I imagine there's other people doing it, but I'm coming at it in a different, in a different way. Like, what if I just give you full price for your property, but you just wait a couple of years, you know, like offering other solutions. So, um, you know, I guess the point of that is just don't be afraid to shift, you know, mm -hmm. and don't like, uh, and shift quickly. Like don't wait if you see it. So maybe the, the, this last part is probably the most important shift quickly and make those decisions quickly because we've, we've seen deals get lost if you don't react timely for sure. And I'm, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure everyone in the room has Jason, anything you would like to add or we're no, it's all good. All right. Okay. Um, well, next question. And, and thank you so much. I mean, that this poll is halfway through and I think we're already getting so much value. Uh, so should investors consider taking the properties with tenants? Yeah. So this is a uh, one that hits me pretty deep. So, so I, I told you I was working with uh, hedge funds, like directly, I'd made some very good contact with some of the larger hedge funds. And I was just basically getting, you know, they would tell me what they'd pay um, before I even got in a contract. But I got, I think over the course of maybe three months, I built a pretty good relationship with one that's one in particular. And they're like, well, if I found a tenant with or a property with a tenant in it, they're like, I can, we can pay this right now, but they're buying based on a cap rate. So they, you know, if the rent is low, they have to make their offer lower. So they're like, well, why don't you just take them under your balance? You need to hold them for, you know, run the lease out and then either raise the rent or, you know, move the tenant out and we'll buy it at this price. So I had nine properties um, that I ended up buying with tenants in them. And I bought them with short-term financing because my plan was never to hold these things, right? I was planning, so I say I'm buying it for 350 and I've already got an offer from, you know, a hedge fund that'll remain nameless at 400, whatever, you know, and all I've got to do is just, you know, pay interest for two, three, four months, whatever it is, and then just sell it up. And um, anyway, I ended up with uh, nine of those in May of last year in June. And pretty much overnight, the uh, spigot shut off. And none of those offers that they'd made me were good anymore. And they were not buying anymore. So I ended up getting stuck with these properties that had tenants in them that I never had planned on owning as rentals. <laughs> so like for the past, you know, for the last six months of 2022, I was just literally working every day trying to figure out how am I going to get out of this without losing everything, basically. Um, which is a, that was a, that was a stressful time, but I guess when it comes to this, I would just say, if you're going to, and this is a change I've made, if you're going to buy a property with a tenant in it, make sure you're comfortable holding it for five years, make sure the debt you're getting on it is it's going to cash flow, or if it's going to be slightly negative cash flow, make for make sure you have that cash set aside and you're ready for it. Like, um, I made a pretty big mistake doing that. And I, cost myself about a million dollars from, um, you know, $400,000 profit to $600,000 loss, um, just by that one, one decision. And, you know, it's, um, so be, be careful with properties with tenants. 
and just make sure that you have it. If you're buying it, you have it uh, set up so it'll cash flow. You're not, you know, you're not banking on selling it right away after the tenant moves out. Like, you know, that's, um, you know, that's something that I will always shy away from in the future, you know, is unless it's, it's a really positive cash flow and I'm going to hold it long term. Like I'm, I'm definitely not marketing right now the properties with tenants. I'll say that. So. Got it. Jason, before you, uh, before you continue and add to this from the SMS marketing perspective, guys, Will just gave a great example that there's always a shot in real estate. You can always get back up. You got to pivot quickly. You got to shift. You got to adjust yourself to your market. So yeah, he did state, which is extremely brave and great that you just set the example here, Will, because there's a lot of people that that really do give up as soon as their pipeline hasn't given them enough for the first two or three months. That kind of consistency that Will is presenting here is basically, at least how I see it and from what I've seen in the past couple of years working for launch, the the source of ROI that, that you're going to see in long term. Yes, you might have a lucky month to close a couple of more deals than you expected, but bottom line, that consistency and, and those quick shifts and adjustments to the market and recognizing where maybe the mistake was, applying a new thing, that's that's probably going to be crucial. Mm-hmm. Thanks, well, Jason? Honestly, after everything that Will said, I can only briefly elaborate. Uh, just one thing, uh, when it comes to buying properties uh, that has tenants inside, um, it's just... It's just very important to actually uh, be careful who the tenant is. Um, I know from experience when doing health check, a lot of there are a lot of vacant properties because the tenants that were previously living there were not really taking care of those properties. And then those prospects, instead of investing and trying to maybe, well, do them, do the fix and flip themselves, it's just too much money to invest. So it really comes down to being careful who you are working with and who is the person that is actually living in that house. Uh, it's a great, especially like if you're, for, for example, a lot of people um, like to do SDR short-term rentals. So when they start in real estate, they start investing, they start wholesaling for the, let's say, first six months to uh, to a year. And then when they have already some cash flow in their pipeline, a couple of leads and everything, they start investing and potentially maybe fix and flipping in the beginning, but transferring to fix and holding fixing those properties, and then later on short-term rentals where they're just kind of going to be exchanging tenants and just keep on the cash flow going on a monthly basis. But be careful who you work with. That's all I'm going to say. (laughs) And Jason, to to piggyback on this, we were talking about the prospects, but talking about who you work with. uh, Well, the next question for you is, should investors partner up? Um, Okay, so I'll tell you how I got into real estate and... um, so I was I was in law school back in 2010 through 2013 in North Dakota of all places, and I was going to be a lawyer or whatever. But um, my roommate at the time and I were both interested in real estate, so we decided, what the heck, we'll start a property management company. So you know, we did it, bootstrapped it, and everything. But 2011, we're golfing with a few people in uh, in our law school class and started talking about. Arizona house prices and how they've dropped, you know, 50%, 70% in some cases, whatever. Um, And we kind of got lucky because one of the guys we were golfing with was um, in his mid fifties and had been very successful. So he said, well, well, let's try and buy some stuff at the auction. You know, he put a million bucks up and he's like, let's go buy 10 properties and see how it works. So from that point, um, we grew from, you know, buying 10 properties in Arizona to about 80 or 90. And then we did the same thing in uh, Florida, uh, buying from the auctions and everything. So that's how I got started was basically managing other people's money. Um, we were do- we were the ones doing the work, um, keeping everything in line, uh, but it wasn't our money. So uh, then from there, I transitioned kind of slowly over the, over the course of maybe seven years to just, you know, using my own money. So um, there was quite a bit of, uh, I mean, it was cool to use other people's money. That's, that's cool, but it's a lot of uh, stress, you know, that you definitely, um, you don't know until you start doing it. So, uh, I mean, my decision over those years was I would, I would prefer to use my own money for deals and do less and make less money and grow slowly 
than, you know, using other people's money. But with that said, like I have a few um, individuals that borrow, lend me money. Um, I was using, uh, when I was flipping mostly what I was using was like, uh, civic is a, is a lender I use a lot and I was getting 70% LTV loans and cause they're, they were at like 6.9% at the time. Um, and then I was getting private money for the, for the down payment. And it was like a blended rate of like 10% or something. So I was saving money doing that. That was great. But, um, I got pretty, I mean, as far as, so I believe in partnering up a lot on the, uh, on the financing side, but that is, um, I guess I'm more comfortable with that because there's a note it's recorded and I owe that money. I owe that person a return. You know, we're not, he's not relying on me to, you know, make the project a success and get X number of dollars back for his investment. Like, uh, you know, uh, that falls on me, you know, he just gets his return. So I'm, I'm more comfortable with that. Um, as far as like partnering, um, you know, on the uh, operations side. Um, so I have a few different entities that I have partners in. Um, but I would say I waited maybe a year and a half, two years of knowing and working with someone, you know, daily, basically, before I you know, partnered with him. And we only partnered on, on uh, buying some rentals. We're like, we both want to buy rentals. Why don't we just buy some rentals together? Right. And I also partnered on another entity with my parents. Um, but they're, they're uh, passive partners and I'm, I'm the managing member. So I guess when it comes to partnering, the most important thing is to have very clear uh, expectations, have them written down, just so that everybody knows what's expected of them and to have a plan if things go south, um, you know, because it's like a marriage, really, it is like if you, you know, because you never know what's going to happen with the market, like over the last nine, 10 months, you know, when everything turned on its head, like I was very lucky that I had, a, uh, you know, a strong relationship with my primary, uh, you know, investor that was funding my down payments, whatever, like, so I had like two and a half million dollars out with him at one point. And like, you know, we worked it out and we, you know, I walked away and took a little haircut. He got all his money back. We're still good friends right now, but that's because we had very clear guidelines, very clear expectations from the front. So um, I guess in general, I would say err on the side of caution when it comes to partnering, um, make sure you know that person and make sure you have the hard conversations up front because when, when a market shifts and you no longer have $30,000 a month coming in or a hundred thousand or, or five, whatever it is like that, you're going to have some hard conversations just like you would with your, with your wife or your, or your uh, husband when you're married, like you got to be able to have those hard conversations. So just be careful and uh, do the work up front before you get into a partnership would be my advice. That's great advice. And I see people already saying that this is really good insight, Will. So I can just echo no. that. Really, thank you so much, Jason. Um, well, all I can say, if anybody um that is joining here, that joined to, in today's mastermind, participated in the last month's mastermind with Lauren Swedenborg, Swedenborg she sent something that is very, very relatable. Uh, partnering up with somebody is just like a marriage. If you're not able to commit, it's bound to fall apart at some point, right? So. <clears throat> Not only that, whether somebody is going to go behind you, but um, even if you don't know that specific person, everything can be done through a contract. But the contract has to be very clear and very specific, very straightforward to cover all the things so nobody can go behind somebody's back and do something on the side or whatever they usually do. Um, and also it depends on uh, uh, system-wise or texting-wise. Um, if we have two people which one, which of the partners is going to be more hands-on, which of, which one is going to be more hands-off, who's going to be in charge of um, delegating the workload, uh, training the, the VAs, the operations manager, acquisition specialists, um, who's going to be in charge of writing those SOPs. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of factors and a lot of moving parts within the partnership. Um, again, it's all about kind of tightening things from within. Partnering up isn't as hard, but then again, maintaining the partnership and maintaining that level of respect that goes both ways is definitely a crucial thing to maintain throughout the whole journey if you would consider partnering up with somebody. 
Totally. And uh, well, we already touched on that personalized approach, uh, searching for niche market, segmenting further. Um, any other strategies that we didn't touch on that you might have found to be the most effective for closing deals in, in a market as competitive as Phoenix is? Um, I mean, I kind of talked about everything, creative financing and whatnot, um, but, you know, just becoming an expert is what I think, is, like, if I could boil it down to anything, you know, find find what interests you, find the niche that makes sense for you, and then become an expert. You have to become, you have to be, you know, be working towards being the best option for those people, you know, so how do you do that? There's a lot of ways, but most of it is, you know, knowledge and experience and um so yeah, there's I don't have a whole lot more to add on that. Um, I think it just comes down to uh, finding finding your niche and working backwards to get there. Mm. On the texting side, well, speed of play is definitely required, right? So it's it's a niche is focus can be really powerful as a sales tool, but it has to be part of the content and response strategy. Kind of knowing the area. Being hyper specific will help them stand out in that niche area. But then again, it's all about like, for example, if we're talking about a competitive market and that speed of play, if a prospect comes in your inbox, responds to your initial message, you can't really go doing something else and leaving that prospect hanging in your inbox without a response for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, couple of hours, or even a couple of days. We've seen those examples too, right? So it's all about responding timely as fast as possible. And most importantly, those leads that show any type of motivation, as long as it's not a DNC or a straight up no not for sale, any motivated leads should be get gotten on the call immediately. Five minutes or even a couple of minutes within after the prospect responded, we want to make sure to surprise them, right? Why? Because if they responded, they took away two minutes of their time. So we want to be respectful enough to take away our two minutes of our time and respond to them uh, back. And if they responded and you try to get them on a call as soon as possible, it's the the chance, the sooner you call them, the chances that they're going to pick up the <clears throat> actually increase. If they answered, responded to your initial message, they have their phones in their hand. If you call them within five minutes, chances are that they're actually going to pick up the phone, uh, the phone, which is a win-win situation for you. You get to engage in a conversation. You get to show yourself, right? Personalizing messages and having personalized content is extremely beneficial, but it all comes down to the way that you are conversating with that prospect on a phone call. What can I give? to the prospect that somebody else can get. Is that a time factor, closing as soon as possible within three to six weeks? Um, is it, am I buying the property as is? So um, so the prospect doesn't even have to worry about anything. So there are, again, a lot of different factors, but luckily we do have, uh, the system is built in that way that we have those features such as quick replies, um, unlimited inbox messages. So you can conversate without taking a look, hey, am I, am I going to pay for additional inbound, outbound messages and so on, drip automations, endless automated follow-ups. And as our uh, senior CSM, Adrian, likes to say, drips are like hiring a brand VA that is only in charge of follow-up. So it kind of saves you and eases you, up, uh, eases you up on the manual work. So speed of play definitely required and one of the most important things in a competitive market. Totally. And um, well, also when whenever anyone, at least within my team says, well, we both, uh, what screams about you is creativity. So I know being creative is one of the main things for you. How you write your content, how you approach your prospects, it's all very much detailed and segmented out and and super creative and and that's really been that way since since all of us have known will um so will what do you think is is the most important factor in building this strong personal brand in in the industry yeah so it's um it's interesting when i talk to people and they're asking me what you know business advice and whatever that i can give and like to me the easiest and like the most effective thing is to just do what you say you're going to do and you know and don't don't over promise and underperform like i've never in my and i'm proud to say this in, in my entire career i've never signed a contract that i didn't intend to close at the time like you know it's like you know you get larger companies and i'm not saying this is wrong it's a different strategy but um you know, with a 30% cancellation rate, like, and stuff like that. Like these people, like 
in general, these people are in some sort of hardship or they're, they're experiencing some issues, right? Like um, I've gone dealing with somebody that's in foreclosure and also going through a divorce. If I tell her I'm going to buy her house and I walk away, like they're relying on me, you know, to, to do what I say I'm going to do. And so, I, I mean, that's, that's the one thing that I've always separated myself um, from others is you see these contracts with a hundred dollars or earnest money. That's just a joke. Like, you know, and, and a 10 day inspection. It's, and it's like, I've always like done the work up front to, you know, like, and, and I'll get deals even if I'm not the highest price because they know I'm going to close, you know, I'm going to put, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 2,000, whatever earnest money. And it's going to be non-refundable. I'm going to waive my inspection period. And I'm going to be able to tell these people I'm going to buy your house, whether I end up wholesaling it or not, doesn't matter. Like, um, at the end of the day, I'm going to follow through on what I tell them. Um, and I think that's one of the, I don't want to get too off on a tangent here, but that's one of the reasons that like our industry gets a bad name is because people are coming in looking for quick money and they think it's supposed to be easy and they'll go in and they'll sign a contract $20,000 above everybody else, like with no intention of closing. Right. And people just get tied up and, and, you know, I've untangled so many other people's messes. Um, and I don't know, I guess like to me, um, just, I made that decision from the get go and I've never changed and I don't foresee myself ever changing from there. Um, but I've also gotten a lot of like personal referrals because of that, you know, like once you follow through over and over again, people trust you. And that means they trust you with their friends and their family and their neighbors and whatever. Like I'm living in a house that I got from a referral from somebody, you know, um, and, you know, I maintain conversation. I maintain relationships with these people, like probably at least 75% of the people I've worked with, you know, I could still call, I could, you know, I still text with whatever, like, so, um, yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, obviously, uh, doing what you say you're going to do and focusing on them, it's about them. It's not about you. It's like, I've, I've done deals where I've made $0. I've even done deals where I've lost, you know, money. Um, because it was my, it was my mistake. You know, I had somebody that wanted to buy it and they were going to, it was a skinny deal. They were going to pay 5,000 bucks. They walked away. So I ended up wholesaling it for less, like, because I said I was going to get this house sold. Like it's that even losing three, five grand, whatever it is, was worth so much in the long term. Um, and it's just the quickest way to ruin your reputation if you don't follow through. Um, for, and the converse is true as well. The more times you do follow through, the more good things uh, come, the more, you know, your name gets out there and people call you and they're like, Hey, you know, I want to uh, invest some money. I want whatever, like, you know, you'll just get a bunch of calls just by doing that. So I'd say do less deals if you have to, but just make sure you actually follow through um, because you get what you give. Like, that's just the truth. So, um, that's probably how I've differentiated myself mostly. Thanks, so. Keep it 100, Will, at all times and everybody else, for sure. Um, and also, so <coughs> definitely Will explain the importance of kind of uh, pulling through what was promised, keeping um, kind of standing up to your expectations or should I not standing up, but in a way, if you say something, you have to keep the word and you have to, you have to show up for it. Right. But if we're talking about like the brand and how you can expand on it, well, since we live in the Wi-Fi internet era, everything is about Google, social media, YouTube. It's definitely worth it to promote your um, yourself, your brand, your knowledge on social media. For example, if you check out another one of our uh, launch control affiliates, Gene Boykin, um, he has half a million followers in Instagram. So what that means is that at some point, as you are investing wholesaling, fix and flipping, at some point, if you expand on social media as well, create a website, um, do blogs, do vlogs, video vlogs as well, right? So what you can do at some point after a longer period of time, when you once you've set your business kind of in stone and you've uh, created a consistent um, pipeline that you should pretty much just have to either maintain or continue expanding, you can be completely hands-off or you can focus on social media. You can focus on um, uh, informative YouTube videos, informative reels, or those shorts on YouTube or whatever whatever it is, updating your blog, uh, making um, 
um, a mentorship program, creating your own masterminds, just like Will is doing. So there are a lot of ways. Also, showing up on different masterminds, um, um, uh, get-togethers, uh, real estate gatherings, and so on and so on. So they're definitely kind of, uh, also promoting yourself, making friends, always um, pulling up to a person, uh, to, uh, to an investor, um, meeting, shaking their hands, showing a certain level of respect. You're going to remember them. They're going to remember you. They're going to talk about the, um, you with their friends when they know what you're doing and so on and so on. So definitely kind of networking personally and through social media. Jason, I always love when you start talking. So guys, um, Jason is, is really someone that they could tell you about all this for, for definitely hours to come. So I, I, I really am a fan. Um, just want to touch on a couple of questions. Uh, but what we'll lay down today, I, I think, is already plenty. We we haven't even been through for half of the planned agenda and has already shared so much. And we're soon going to have a final Q&A. So basically, we focused here on, on having the most natural conversation. We really didn't want to stick to the agenda. We we actually wanted to, you know, get the good brainstorm going on, uh, just get everyone's everyone's thoughts uh, out there and and make sure that you know just we all copy we all participate so again i got some great messages in the chat box uh, please feel free to ask more questions there before we start the final q a well uh just to to wrap up with these a uh, couple of questions jason, jason mentioned technology and social networks and and how everyone uses everything these days as they should networking is a is a very important part of the business. So how do you use technology and, and SMS to your advantage, but also how do you stay up to date? Where do you look for trends? Where do you find the information that's uh, relevant business-wise for you? Yeah, so I, I mean, I only use SMS uh, for marketing. That's my only marketing channel right now. Um, I've done some Facebook po marketing in the past and some, you know, I've done uh direct mail or whatever but like right now and really for the last couple of years um i've only used sms because i feel it's um it's definitely it's like just, there's just no argument it's the best roi it's not even close so um as far as like the marketing side that's what i do and my plan um going forward and i'm and i'm probably wrong on this or i'm you know there's other ways to do this but my plan going forward is to increase the uh, SMS marketing that I'm doing to the point where I feel like I've kind of maxed it out before I even think about adding another channel because like I know the the return that you can get on these other advertising channels and it's nowhere near um, what you can get with SMS. So um, I guess in that sense, I'm, a, I'm basically, I'm kind of a true believer when it comes to this. Um, because it's like, how can you get better than like, literally it's, you know, showing up in their pocket on their, you know, um, so instant communication, whatever. Uh, but I, I definitely am not um, where I need to be as far as like social media presence and, and uh, all the online stuff. I just, I am, you know, I've, I tried last year, I hired somebody to kind of help, but it's just not, it's just not what I've, uh, what I've done. Um, I definitely want to, because part of my, um, I guess part of what's important to me is giving back and, you know, helping as many people as I can. Um, and that's one way to do it for sure. So that's something I need to get better at. Um, definitely. So don't take my advice on, you know, Facebook and Instagram and anything like that. But as far as staying up to date, um, so we have in Phoenix, um, we have a company called the Cromford Market or the Cromford Report. Um, and they have in-depth real-time statistics for the uh, real estate market. And it's better than anything I've ever seen. I mean, I, I've been using it since 2012, summer 13, something like that, when I lived in North Dakota. And I actually met with Michael Orr, asking him if he could expand to the Fargo market where we were in at the time. And he's like, yeah, it's not big enough. <laughs> like, you know, Phoenix is like 5 million people. Fargo's like, you know, half a million if you count all the... So uh, that... But the comfort market report is is definitely the the best leading indicators. But I also um, I also follow macroeconomics and um, I follow all of like what the Fed's doing and I watch interest rates and and uh, bonds and and everything like that. 
just to kind of put together my own macro uh, thesis on what's, you know, coming in the future. Um, so obviously I watch the real estate market like a hawk as well, um, just for any little changes that I can see. Uh, because last year caught me off guard. Like I was, I had prepared um, for six months of, uh, you know, cause in 2008, it happened over the course of like two, two and a half years, but the first six months were really where you could tell this happened in like a week. So, and I think part of that is, is the social media and interconnectivity and um, how instant communication is right now. So, I mean, I don't know how to necessarily prepare going forward um, other than to just, just to be on top of all the current events, be on top of what's happening in the real estate market, having conversations with agents, with investors, if you're wholesaling, especially you can tell when something's changing, if people are aggressive or conservative, or if they're changing their buy boxes. Um, I always kind of uh, follow, you know, follow all of those things. And then, like I said before, I guess I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, and I spend a lot of uh, time and money on education generally. So um, as far as networking, though, I guess the only thing I would say, um, I've always been a networker, but I'm not that type of person that has, you know, a thousand people in their in their phone that they pretend to be friends with or whatever. Um, like I keep my circle pretty small, you know, people that have the same values as I do. Um, like it, I'm not, I'm not the type of, I don't run the type of business where I blast out, you know, uh, deals to, you know, 10,000 people and hope that one, you know, one of them comes forward with the offer. Like I would rather, you know, have 50 people that I know are real. And if they tell me they're going to take it, they're going to take it because that lets me have the integrity with the seller. It's just an easier thing. Um, but it is hard to scale that, you know, so it depends on what you're looking to build. For me, I've learned I don't really want to scale to be like the biggest wholesaling company in the country at all. Um, so that's, you know, that's the way that I do it. And that's, that's just my approach, though. I'm not saying that's the only way or the right way, or maybe not even the right way for you, but I know it works. So I figured I would share it. Got it. Well, thank you so much. And <coughs> as far as your presence in social media goes, you've been very present in our social media these days. I <laughs> mentioned that Will is one of our affiliates. So if any of you are guests this session, not launch users still, uh, this is Will's sign-up link. So feel free to use that one if you want to try out the platform. But bottom line, Will, could we say that... Give me a call to it. Like... I, I'm not, I don't believe in like selling stuff without like, give me a call. If you, if you're thinking about signing up, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to do a zoom call, show you kind of like what it looks like on the back and how I actually use it. Um, I mean, I've, I've gotten quite a few people like friends of mine um, have come to launch control as well, but um, you know, it's a product I personally believe in and I've used batch and I've used uh, Sherpa and like, you know, I went, I used four or five different text softwares before I found the one that works the best. And I've stuck with launch ever since. So feel free to reach out if you have questions. Well, that is great. And guys, this is definitely a call to action. If if any of you just want to learn more about us, marketing, if you feel like, you know, there's something extra to it that, that you might have not figured out well as there as the ultimate POC, I would say. And also talking about the strategy, if you do uh, ever sign up also for those that are that are our launchers already, uh, there's our success team. Uh, those guys basically free of charge every day share strategy pieces with you. We're soon going to uh, fire up a series of, of short video snippets, just uh, uh, strategy pieces, educational parts. But also we're running this mastermind series for, for that uh, very reason. So there are no <laughs> earnings whatsoever based off of it, but we really do believe in an education as a crucial part of SMS marketing engagement as well. So our support team also can help if anyone has trouble signing up and for, for any strategy questions, there's there's our success team. So these are the the guys that are my team. So of course, I'm going to shout them out <laughs> for the end of this call. But 
Um, other than that, well, just any common mistakes and SMS marketing engagement that you might have noticed before we we give people a couple of minutes to to ask you any of their own questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as as it relates to SMS marketing, it's like you're probably going to fail a little bit, right? Like whether you fail right away or you have some success and then you fail for a little while and then you have success, like, um, like you may not create the perfect template right away. You know, you probably won't, but that doesn't mean that it's not effective. It just means you need to change what you're doing or change how you're responding to them or, you know, change your process a little bit. So I would say the, the biggest issue I find with most people is they will just give up so fast. It's like, if you're going to, make an investment and actually do this like you should at least plan on i mean a minimum of six months at least you know probably a year um you know to to really to get the feel for it and, and hone your craft in a little bit um so that's 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 one of the um common mistakes i guess in general really that's really with anything with life in general just you know everybody wants quick you know success and uh instant gratification and, and it's just not it's just it sometimes happens, but it's because you have a longer term approach and, you know, um, and it, I gotta say like going through some hard times makes the successes feel so much sweeter. So, um, yeah, I would just say, don't give up on that. And, uh, let's see. Yeah. Com I mean, other common mistakes, just don't over promise and under deliver. Just, you know, don't, don't tell them what they want to hear just because you know, like, just because you want them to go with you, like, don't tell them what they want to, what you know they want to hear. Tell them what you can actually do. You know, what, because if you don't follow through, what does it matter anyway? You know, so and those are probably two most common. Thank you so much. Well, Jason, anything you, you want to add before <coughs> we go for the, the final Q&A? Just briefly to add to what Will said, um, system-wise, the most common mistakes uh, are that we've seen happen is basically not knowing or not really caring enough to learn about the tool that you're using, all the features within, how they can help you. So uh, going back to exploring, finding a niche and everything, but those moving parts are usually what, um, what are mostly common mistakes. So learn a bit more about the tool that you're using, explore different options, different opportunities. Um, um uh, creating and communicate with the launch control people too like i can i can tell you like when i first started with launch control everything was way different than it like drip automations i didn't even realize that was a thing like until probably three months after they launched it like they're constantly upgrading and that they're constantly updating and making things better like the way that drip drip campaigns used to be you had to like click them you know, each okay, every day. You remember that? You know, things are just, <laughs> yeah, things are just getting so much better constantly. So if you have a problem, reach out to them. They're very proactive. And that's why I stick with launch control over the other um, options. Just to add to that, if you ever receive a phone call from somebody from the success team, I promise you, we ain't selling nothing. We just want to help you. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, so Jasmine had a question. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious. So she's asking, you know, how do we close deals with the ongoing bank crisis, basically? Um, a lot of prospects are using that as an objection. I'm curious how how they're using it as an objection. Like, what are they saying? Because honestly, it, it hasn't affected really anything. Uh, you know, the market hasn't really changed. I mean, I guess more so than anything over the last, um, you know, year. Um, I've noticed people are staying put more because the interest rates are high and they give up their 3% to get a 7%, whatever. Like, but even with that, like, it's like, get creative. Like, uh, like right now people, sellers, you know, like put yourself in a seller's shoe, shoes, like you, they can get the, they can, they'll pay to buy down the interest rate. Like you can buy down, you can have a seller contribution of up to 6% on FHA loans. And um, that can get you down into like the mid fours right now. So um, yeah, I mean, anyway, I, I don't know. I just, was, it's an interesting question and I would, I would just say like, you know, overcoming that objection. It's like, really, are we seeing it? Are we seeing it in our market? Like, is the market slowing? No, it's speeding up. Like at least here we've dropped from 22,000 inventory to 14 in you know, two and a half months. It's like 30%, which is crazy. So market's getting tighter and it's getting hotter and it's moving towards the seller's market. So, you know, what they're telling themselves is really not the truth. And I think you just have to educate them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Well, this is amazing. Thank you so much. And okay, there's the next question. So guys, you can feel free to start with the Q&A, <coughs> just post questions in the chat box. We'll can see them. Uh, so we'll care to share any KPIs. It varies by market, et cetera, but I still like to hear ballpark numbers for texts per closed deal and get a closed deal per 8K750 text, for instance. That's for multiple numbers per seller and multiple attempts. Brian, uh, if you are using launch, also feel free to ping me or Jason here, but well, I believe you are able to expand on this one. Yeah, I mean, so I'm pretty bad in general. I like I'm not, I'm not uh, able to do the analysis like myself. I don't know those KPIs for my own business, but I mean, I did, you know, a year ago. But then everything got turned on its head. So I'm just kind of getting back to the point. But I would say, like in general, um, I definitely am closing more deals than one in eight eight thousand. I just don't know. I mean, I'll have to I'll have to have somebody that actually understands statistics look at my database and tell me this stuff, um, which is something that I've got kind of planned for the next six months. But right now, I don't know. I I could just the the most important things for me are to watch are the uh, response rates mostly. Like I mean, deliverability matters a lot, right? Like if it's low, you're doing something wrong or something's wrong. So obviously, if it's low, you know, fix that first. But the response rates, like. Um, I mean, my average response rate is probably in like the 15 ish percent. Um, and I can, I notice those falling below like, you know, eight or 9% when I'm using like more generic messages or like if, if it's in the single digits for the most part, like for a, a while, like I'm going to change a template or I'm going to change something I'm doing because, um, you know, just over the course of three years, like I'm used to mid double digits and that usually means I'm doing a pretty good job. Um, but yeah, I, I would imagine Jason can probably get elaborate more on like average uh, KPIs than I can, because I'm just not there yet. If you don't mind me jumping in, Jade, let's just uh, expand on rather than how, how many texts per deal. Let's expand on all the other stuff that, that is affecting this and where, where the primary focus should be, at least how we see it from the launch angle. Um, so, for example, at the beginning of last year, uh, before the whole started ten DLC began, we also had a, a had a, a like a an approximate number of text messages that you need to send in order to get a deal. So the approximate was around ten thousand messages. But then again, there are a lot of factors that are affecting that. Not only the response rate, deliverability rate, but generally everything. Number one is quality of your data. If your data is bad, we cannot expect good results, right? Same as with the uh, skip tracing service that you use. Same as with the market that you're targeting. Well, again, now we're uh, learning um, from Will how to do with the competitive market as well. Um, so... Uh, so definitely a lot of factors that are affecting. So it, it really comes quality of your content as well, the way that you're texting your prospects using certain features, conversating uh, through inbox messages, uh, what, how we are your uh, quick replies built and so on and so on. But it really comes down to what you're doing, how you're marketing, are you seg doing uh, segmenting, are you personalizing content based on what you segment in within that campaign and so on and so on. So, I mean, uh, not really a specific number, but the numbers definitely vary. For example, um, um, so as um, Brian mentioned, he closes a deal per 750 text, right? Sometimes that's going to be one deal in 6,000 texts, and sometimes it's going to be one deal in 15,000 texts. But when you kind of sum it up all on a yearly basis or a monthly basis, it comes down to being, let's say, somewhere averaging on 10,000 messages, one deal. But a lot of things have to align for you to um, keep the average consistently, right? So it's going to go up and down, but kind of finding a way on how you can just maintain it, go through with it, and find <laughs> one specific thing that definitely works for you, works for prospects, or easier, easier said, find yourself. Just like Will uh, mentioned, an extremely important thing, going back to integrity. If you say something, you better go through it. Otherwise, you're going to lose the respect and you're going to lose all the integrity and all the chances of actually closing a deal or even making a connection with that prospect, with that lead, right? So it all comes down to, are you able to fulfill your promises and also the way that you are using all of those factors, quality data, skip tracing, market, quality content, the way you are having a conversation, and that's it. Thank you so much, Jason. And guys, uh, just the most... Thank you, Brian, and great question. Uh, 
the most simple example I can give you. So I open a brand new light account. Let's say someone signed up a month ago um, and I see a, a hot and warm lead breakdown that is huge. And then I, I go into an underutilized pro account with a much higher monthly and daily volume. I don't see drips being utilized. I don't see custom tags being used. Uh, there's really not a, a, a quick response in terms of average reply time in their inbox. Uh, maybe the content can be edited and tweaked a little bit, uh, or maybe we identified that the data itself, especially if it has a lot of landlines, you can basically, there are some markers where you can notice if, if the data might be off. So all of those things obviously do not depend on the volume of initial messages or how many texts per day am I going to send. It really matters how many conversations am I going to start today and how many conversations am I going to successfully maintain, especially if I recognize the, the criteria that, that I'm looking for. So as Will mentioned earlier, uh, don't close a deal just, just for the sake of closing it, right? So make sure that your timing is right, that you're there. If any of the conditions not don't do not fit you to start with, uh, the deals are in the follow-up for sure. That's the fortune of the follow-up, as as we call it here in Launch Control. Um, thank you, Jason, so much. And well, thank you. This was this was an amazing conversation, if you ask me. So thank you so much. And we are a little bit over time. Uh, if anyone has any final questions. Feel free to ask. If not, we're going to wrap it up till till the next month. And we'll, of course, if there's any parting statement, if we don't have any questions. Okay, no questions. So, well, anything you well, want? I guess. To I guess. Yeah. My last. My last thought would just be: right now is an amazing time to be getting into real estate. So, if you're like new, it's it's an amazing time to be getting in to real estate because everybody's very uncertain. Uh, but the fundamentals are pretty strong, like longer, longer term over the next, say, two to five years. Um, I think it's, you know, we're we're in a pretty good spot. Um, but a lot of people have fallen out. A lot of people have fallen out over the last six to 12 months. So um, if you get in now and you're consistent and you, you know, you stick to it, like it's going to be a very, very good time to get into real estate. Um, and I would also look into the uh, creative side of things. So um, that. I guess those are my thoughts. Thank you. Um, it's going to be very brief for me. Jason, you want to add anything? Nothing that we already haven't said. Just thank you. I appreciate all of you for joining and sure hope to see a lot more of you as well on upcoming masterminds. Absolutely. Well, thank you for, for putting all this together with us, for working with us. Uh, it was great having you all here, and we are definitely looking forward to, to talking creative financing next month with you. So. Till the next time. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate Take care, guys. Bye. Take care.